Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Evan Benjamin, and I'm the Chief Medical Officer at Ariadne Labs. And it's my pleasure to welcome you today to Ariadne Labs' annual community meeting. Thank you all so much for joining us. As COVID-19 continues to upend our life, we have made a number of changes to our annual meeting. The first is we're virtual for the first time. And I wanna thank our amazing staff at Ariadne Labs who's worked so hard to make this virtual meeting possible. We also made another notable change that we made this open to the public. Usually we have a closed door meeting, but at this time when research around COVID-19 is changing so rapidly, we felt it was really important to be part of a larger, broader discussion as members of our community are all working on so many aspects of COVID-19. And today, while we're focusing on the COVID-19 virus, we'd also like to pause and recognize our support for the national and the international protests for racial justice. Racial equity has always been a core value of Ariadne Labs. And as George Floyd's death and as the disproportionate impact that we've seen that COVID has had on people of color continue to remind us, we need to strengthen commitment to the, that principle. Racism is a public health issue. And as we go through today's talks, I urge this community to also think about how we can continue to consider how we ensure that all the tools and all the solutions that we are proposing, how they can all be accessed by all the communities we serve. For those of you joining us for the first time, Ariadne Labs is a healthcare innovation center at the Harvard School of Public Health and the Brigham and Women's Hospital. It consists of approximately 110 staff and core faculty, all engaged in the design of scalable solutions to improve healthcare delivery. In addition, our research community includes 153 associate faculty and affiliate members. These associate faculty and affiliate members all come from a broad range of very distinguished institutions, and they work with us by providing collaboration through mentorship, through working on projects, research projects, as well as papers and grants, and they are really an integral part to our organization's success. The COVID-19 pandemic has touched every part of the healthcare system. It's never been more urgent or necessary for the diversity of thought and for communities like ours to be able to share innovations, new learnings, solutions, in order to help patients, clinicians, and health systems. Let me share some data with you on the impact that COVID is having worldwide. This next slide from Johns Hopkins University shows that since January of this year, COVID has surpassed all leading causes of death, now accounting for nearly 20% of the world's deaths in 2020. It certainly puts our work in perspective and has really been a real calling for us Ariadne has always been about improvement and scale. And yet, as a result of all of this, we've had to really be very agile and we've had to pivot much of our work towards COVID. I'm very proud of all that pivot that we've made. Today, you'll hear from a range of topics that reveal just how much COVID-19 is changing the global healthcare system, including nursing care, primary care, palliative care, surgery, community health, global health, architecture and design, and mitigation strategies that we've learned from the global health experience. Just a few event housekeeping here. We are very excited about this meeting. You're gonna hear a rapid fire set of short talks today, each five minutes or so. We'll probably have time for one, maybe two questions for each speaker. Please use the Q&A function to ask any questions that come up. And we're also handling any technical questions through the Q&A function. We'll be engaging our broader community through social media. If you're going to use social media, please use the hashtag Ariadne Innovation when sharing. We're gonna have two sessions today. 
The first will focus on the system and care changes that have resulted from COVID. The second will really talk about the future as we move forward with and after the pandemic. I'd like to now hand it over to Ariadne Labs Executive Director, Asaf Bito. Well, thanks so much, Evan. Thank you for that introduction and for all that you're doing to foster a culture of intellectual investigation, curiosity, and action in our community. I'm really happy to be here together with you all um, to um, see uh, old friends, to meet new friends, and to really welcome you to our community. Um, we, uh, I really want to especially welcome those of you who are um, um, perhaps interacting or visiting with us for the first time. And um, I hope it won't be the last. And I hope that what you find here will want you uh, want, want to make you um, connect even further with with so much of the amazing work that's being done throughout this community. Um, I also want to acknowledge that this is really a moment in time that we can't just do business as usual. And I want to say that so many, too many people cannot breathe right now, especially in the black community due to twin pandemics, overlapping pandemics of COVID and racism. We have to articulate and name how the same structures and forces that exacerbate the latter drive the former. As we necessarily say that Black Lives Matter, we also affirm that it's our work as public health and clinical practitioners to name these factors, but not just name them, to understand them deeply, to measure them, to write about them, but then to act together and understand that we act together by understanding them as structural forces that drive suffering. I've said it before to those of you who have discussed this, but these times have shown that it's, they've illuminated, the virus has illuminated how interconnected we all are. And despite that, how inequitably apart we remain, especially in this country. Our job in public health and in clinical medicine is to bridge this gap in order to reduce suffering for all. So our mission at Ariadne is always been to develop simple, scalable solutions to improve the delivery of all people's health care at the most critical moments in their lives. That means that we work to improve health systems, micro or macro, and also to improve public health, both locally and globally. We've been around since 2012, and as you'll see from our community, we represent a wide swath of interests, disciplines, people, and areas of focus. As Evan mentioned, when COVID-19 began sweeping across the world, we knew that as a clinical and public health organization, we had to be involved in that response. And you're probably here because you've been involved in that response. It's obvious that it's become an unprecedented local and global emergency. And we also knew that by virtue of being in between institutions and disciplines that we had people, tools, and resources to help. So what we've done over the past few months is lean into that, build and diffuse our interconnections with you, our community members and friends, to mobilize, to develop, design, test, and spread solutions in six areas that we have previous experience and connections in. And those areas have been in community mitigation, such as social distancing and other tools to reduce the spread of COVID in communities. They've been in the area of seniors and vulnerable populations, how to mitigate the effects both on vulnerable groups, but also the effects of our public health interventions that isolate people and that can exacerbate underlying conditions. We've worked on a global response, especially for low and middle income countries in which we have to think even before vaccines are ready, how we act equitably allocate and deliver them. And we have to think about how to maintain essential health services in the face of a health shock like this. We've done work in safe surgery and safe systems around how to improve safety and throughput in operating rooms that are changing by the days in the midst of a pandemic. We've done work in obstetrics from pre 
to um, prepartum to postpartum to intra delivery and labor and delivery mechanisms and also how to understand and, and mitigate the continued effects of racism and inequitable structures on maternal and child health here and abroad. And we've done work on the rapidly changing landscape of outpatient care, the virtualization of care in the same way that our meetings have now been virtualized here. Very conservatively speaking, we've produced over 25 tools, 35 perspective pieces and numerous um, um, ways of garnering attention for this work. But more importantly, we've been part of a larger movement to really try to link clinical medicine and public health. Our solutions, some of which you'll hear from today, draw on new research. They draw on our frontline clinical experience of so many at the lab. And they draw on the resources and accumulated knowledge of all in the lab around health systems innovation, emergent public health threat amelioration, and the curiosity and creativity of all of our staff and faculty. Ariadne was founded to live in the space between healthcare delivery and academic medicine and public health, which means that we exist between quality improvement, between health system change, evaluation, and, um, and rigorous evidence um, construction, but also implementation of known solutions. So living in this space in between, we have an opportunity and a necessity to act as COVID has tested us in so many ways. It requires answers yesterday with incomplete evidence and incomplete understanding even of the parameters around which we are designing. It's forcing us to put our scientific method and our human-centered design method on display, asking us to accelerate faster already challenging design, testing, and scaling processes. But we're able to do that because we have a community of you, clinicians, staff, researchers, public health practitioners, and others who are able to help us together design solutions that are equitable, solutions that narrow disparities, not widen them, and solutions that pragmatically approach the problems at hand to help us maintain the delivery of essential health services and help us ameliorate the impact of a new virus, as well as address the systemic virus of systemic racism through the years. I'm continually humbled and impressed and honored to work together with this incredible group of people and this incredible community. And though we're separated virtually, I think we still clearly are showing that we're staying connected. So today, what you'll hear really is a testament to what's possible through local and global collaboration, through innovation that really approaches pragmatically, thoughtfully, and empathically the problems that face us. I'm so happy to be part of this, and I turn it back to you, Evan. Thanks so much, Asaf. Well, hold, grab, a, grab a chair, hold on. We've got 10 rapid fire short talks today uh, on the innovations in COVID-19. Our, our first speaker is Amy Shao. Amy is a principal with the Mass Design Group, and she'll be speaking about redesigning hospital spaces on the fly to protect healthcare workers. Amy? Hi, thanks so much for having me here today. So Mass Design Group is a nonprofit architecture research firm based in Boston, Massachusetts, and Kingali, Rwanda, where I'm calling from right now. Uh, over the past decade, we've taken on a range of work across geographies to promote health and equity. Um, so while on the one hand, we've done projects like um, the design of the National Memorial for Peace and Justice in Montgomery, Alabama for an Equal Justice Initiative, which is just addressing healing on a societal level, We've also spent the last 10 years partnering with global organizations working on the front lines of global epidemics from responding to Ebola in Liberia and cholera in Haiti. So what I wanted to present today was um, a case study which in late March was initiated by two doctors at Mount Sinai Hospital at the epicenter of the New York City pandemic at that moment, John Bukovalas and Michael Dollinger, who reached out to us to see if there are ways that the physical environment of COVID-19 care units could be tweaked to lower infection risk to healthcare workers. 
So then we in turn pulled in our colleagues at RIID Labs to bring a systems thinking angle. Next slide. Um, you know, we, we recognized that there were a lot of hospitals implementing spatial redesigns on the fly to prepare, prepare for the COVID-19 surge. And what we wanted to do was capture quick interventions that were working and also share lessons to assist other facilities. And the first thing that we realized was that any research and collaboration would have to be very nimble in order to be helpful. So over the course of three weeks, we ran a rapid response spatial research methodology which was adapted from methods that we'd previously developed with Ariadne on a study that linked um, L&D unit design to C-section rates. So using GoPros and Zooms, but also analog stuff like paper and crayons, the clinicians were our eyes and ears on the ground and helped us peer in really well to active COVID care units, annotate floor plans and extract lessons to share. Next slide. So um, this next one will show you some visuals that help to convey the spatial modifications that Mount Sinai had made. Um, starting in mid-March, they converted 260 normal patient rooms to specialized COVID care rooms suitable for airborne isolation. And across three units that we looked at, which were an adult ICU, med surge med unit, and then a unit in the children's hospital, what we saw was that a lot of critical care was taking place beyond the patient room. To minimize clinician exposure, uh, we saw that corridors had become these do-everything spaces, and there were IV poles, patient monitors, PPE carts, trash cans, workstations, it was doing it all. And we realized really quickly that enforcing proper infection control protocols in corridors and these key thresholds like unit entrances was just as important as in the patient rooms. Next slide. Um, so when we were zooming around and um, doing all of this together, which was really fascinating to do from my um, kitchen in Rwanda, we saw a lot of design hacks which were tremendously innovative, but also revealed implementation gaps and created some confusing variability between units, like things like signage, the way that individual face shields were being stored. Um, we also saw differences in personal perception of risk zones between, uh, within care units. So in this picture here on the left, um, one of the things we did was ask clinicians to create risk heat maps and we had them color code floor plans with red for hot areas, green for clean areas, and orange for warm. And as you can see here, three clinicians drew totally different heat maps of the same space. So what we concluded from that initial study was the notion that spatial literacy, how you read and perceive space, has a really important implication on the interpretation of safety protocols. Um, and then in the end, visual cues, even things as simple as paint or tape on the floor can be a really powerful tool to orient people in a care environment that's otherwise um, really unfamiliar and constantly changing and high stress. Um, so I think we're really excited that uh, there's huge potential for researchers, um, designers, uh, care professionals to collaborate to develop sp greater spatial literacy and implement strategic design interventions. Amy, thank you so much. That was really fantastic um, and very, very intriguing. Um, you know, and just to think about uh, how we understand the relationship between the design of a unit and even an individual's uh, spatial perspective and how the impact it would have on uh, transmission and their own protection. Um, as you think about where this will go, and at Ariadne, we often think about scale. Uh, how do you think? Um, how do you think about the scalability? Uh, of this project? Yeah, so what I spoke to today was a three-week case study, as I mentioned, on one large urban hospital in the midst of the surge, which looked at ways to minimize infection control for clinicians and dedicated COVID care units. So our team is now trying to get to the middle of the Ariadne arc, and we're working to get to put together a learning collaborative of multiple health systems we want to look at a broad range of facility types in a broad range of geographic contexts and in different moments of that wax and wane of the pandemic. We want to also look at a broader set of care delivery spaces, not just dedicated COVID care units, um, a larger definition of safety beyond infection control, also things like communication and morale and stress management, and all health workers, not just clinicians. Um, so ultimately, we're really hoping to develop some clear spatial guidance that could be used globally by health systems to transform their infrastructure in this COVID era. And we feel like a new awareness of 
how space can help or hurt is going to be a, a good jumping off point to creating a healthier built environment moving forward. Thank you so much, Amy. Our next speakers are Joyce Edmonds and Maureen Farrell. Joyce is an associate professor at Boston College, the Connell School of Nursing, and Maureen is faculty at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and Harvard Medical School's uh, Department of OBGYN, and they'll be presenting on nursing insight and COVID-19. Thank you for this opportunity to present a snapshot of our work today. Um, nursing is the largest healthcare profession in the United States. And for the past 18 years, Americans have ranked nursing as the most honest and trusted across all professions. Um, the extraordinary challenges brought on by COVID-19 has really challenged the essential governance of nursing that is embodied in direct bedside care of patients. So we're gonna briefly discuss these challenges in the context of Nurse Impact, which is a portfolio of projects which utilize labor and delivery nurse practice data to direct quality improvement. Um, next slide, please. I first um, have to acknowledge our awesome team at Ariadne's Delivery Decisions Initiative, our hospital partners, and OB Cope in Washington State. Next slide, please. Labor and delivery nurses attend uh, close to 4 million hospital births in the U.S. annually, and they are the most visible presence, spending more time at the bedside than any other clinician on the care team. And in fact, this time at the bedside, uh, providing labor support and assessing maternal fetal status is thought to be key to supporting safe vaginal delivery and avoiding unnecessary surgical births. The figure on the right summarizes a couple of our key or early project findings. Um, first, simply that there is significant variation in individual nurse level cesarean birth rates, which signals a quality problem. Um, and then second, that the distribution of nurse rates is similar to the variation observed in physicians. Next slide, please. So based on this data and the knowledge that nearly all successful efforts to reduce cesarean rates have used physician feedback as a guide, we were in the process of developing and testing an audit and feedback intervention for labor and delivery purpose, uh, labor and delivery nurses. Um, the basic premise is that extending this QI intervention to nurses could provide an important new level to improve the quality of care during childbirth. But enter COVID-19, which suspended our person-facing research at hospitals, and we needed to adapt our strategy to account for the impact of care delivery changes that have really complicated the imperative that nurses have to remain at the bedside. So through a planned expert convening and serving a national sample of nurses, we hope to better understand how alterations in policy and practices in response to COVID are impacting nursing care in relation to delivery outcomes. And I'd now like to pass it over to Dr. Farrell to present a few of our questions. Next slide, please. So as our team began to ponder what the effect of COVID is going to have, particularly in the arena of labor and delivery, the virtue of trust really bubbled to the top. And as Joyce alluded, the, the trust in the nursing profession has been omnipresent for nearly two decades. And we wonder, with some information that we have anecdotally, whether this trust is changing. First, from the patient perspective, because that bond that they had with this bedside support is no longer there, perhaps out of fear for their own health from the nurse side. To also, we have found that, that patients are not as forthcoming with symptoms that their partners might be having of COVID-19, knowing that that would then bar them from the hospital. The next question that arose to us was whether there was gonna be a change in the cesarean delivery rates, not only at the hospital level, but at the individual levels. And we could hypothesize why this could be both an increase or a decrease in these rates. An increase in rates, and in order to really optimize uh, personnel resources, and then a decrease in these rates, uh, not only for the same reason, but also because you would wanna optimize the re material resources such as OR availability and personal protective equipment. Finally, as we consider redesigning uh, care delivery systems, we're not sure how exactly that's going to work in a traditionally bedside, very personal and intimate experience that patients go through with not only their nurses, but their entire care team. 
At this time, again, I'd like to thank um, our new labs and open it up for any questions that you might have. Thank you so much, Joyce and Maureen. Um, really fascinating stuff. I think we are really understanding now the, the influence that nurses have on outcomes. I'm curious what you think the differences you'll see in the different settings. Um, and also, how, how do you anticipate, what do you think will be the largest contributing factor to, uh, to change care practice? Um, those are some great questions, and I think there are some many dependencies um, in terms of overall cesarean rates, depending on the prevalence of the virus in a particular area, the birth volume um, at a hospital, the availability of PPE, um, and the unit culture at baseline in relation to childbirth practices. Um, in terms of changes in nursing practice, I think the potential of reduced time spent at the bedside providing labor support, um, limited use of position equipment like birth balls or peanut balls, or efforts um, that are in place to minimize the duration of active pushing and delays in response time um, could contribute to um, changes in rates. Um, but I'll then turn it over to Maureen, um, who has some data from uh, New York. Looking at the hospital levels, we have seen um, some pretty big differences when we look at Washington State and then New York. In Washington State, they are um, anecdotally seeing with some initial data that the cesarean delivery rates are increasing, whereas in New York, uh, New York City in particular, they're seeing that their rates are decreasing. And so that made us wonder whether there might be this initial impetus to try to move people through labor and delivery in a more um, efficacious manner, um, instead of having a long drawn out labor process to go to cesarean. Whereas there might be a threshold point, likely what they experience in New York City, where that might be your intent, but you might overwhelm the system to a point. Um, this unfortunately leads us to wonder whether there are some unnecessary cesarean deliveries being performed in some certain circumstances, but at the same time, are there some deliveries that probably could have been served better via cesarean and they just didn't have the resources, material or personnel wise to, to do it, such as in New York City? Okay. Thank you so much, Joyce and Maureen. We're going to switch now to the world of uh, health centers. And I'd like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Ravi Kabaseri. Ravi serves as the medical director of quality and population health for Ultimate Health Services. His talk entitled, How the Largest Federally Qualified Health Center in America Navigated COVID to Address Health Equity. Ravi. Thanks, Evan. And thank you, Saf, for the opportunity to present today. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. As this group is well aware, uh, communities of color, particularly black individuals and Latinos, are bearing the brunt of the COVID-19 pandemic. And the reasons for this are well known. Uh, they're the result of systemic racism and inequities across our healthcare delivery system. Next slide, please. So our organization, Ultimate Health Services, is located at the epicenter of the COVID-19 pandemic in California. We serve the communities of East Los Angeles predominantly, uh, which are largely Latino, poor, and underserved. Many of our patients are low-income essential workers. They're more likely to live in crowded housing and unable to self-isolate or shelter in place. And they're less likely to have adequate access to basic legal protections, including paid sick leave. So when the COVID-19 pandemic hit, as leaders of Altamed, we were faced with a difficult challenge that's been faced by all of our community health delivery system colleagues. How are we going to tackle COVID-19 in our communities, which are testing deserts, but are bearing the, bur the burden of the um, COVID pandemic? And how would we do this without any guarantee of financial support or reimbursement? Uh, well, the care is changing, but our responsibility for caring does not. Next slide, please. We prioritized three key changes to our care delivery system. First, we looked for a partner to help us scale access to COVID testing in our communities because we knew they were going to be the ones hardest hit. We partnered with the Los Angeles and Orange County Departments of Public Health for access to testing kits. And as of last week, Ultimate performed 42,000 tests in the communities that we serve. This includes not just for our patients, but also for community members. This constitutes 11% of all testing that's been done in Los Angeles and Orange County to date. And as we anticipated, our testing positivity rate in the communities that we serve have consistently been higher than the rest of Los Angeles and Orange County. Second, we pivoted our care delivery system to telehealth. 
Prior to COVID, as folks are aware, community health centers really are bottlenecked by face-to-face -face visits. 100% of our, face, our physician visits were face-to-face. 50% of our care is now telehealth. We had a drop in system access and capacity in March as we were standing up this infrastructure, but since April, we've maintained health system access and visits to pre-COVID levels. And we're now transitioning from phone-based visits to video visits. Third, we proactively outreach to those patients who need us most, including our diabetic patients, frail elders, and children with complex conditions. At Ultimed, we have over 11,000 uncontrolled diabetic patients. And in the months of March, April, and May, 58% of our uncontrolled diabetics had a touch point, a visit with a physician, either by phone or in person. Likewise, today, in a partnership with the Children's Hospital of Los Angeles, we're currently scaling drive-through immunization clinics for all of our pediatric patients. Next slide, please. So what reflections would we like to share with this group? Like all of you, we're still processing what we're learning. But a key learning for us has been that the conversation needs to move beyond the potential of telehealth. What we're really talking about is moving care delivery beyond brick and mortar care and meeting the patient where they are. Two specific examples for you. First, in our communities, the challenge is an absence of broadband communication. So as much as we would like to stand up video visits for our patients, we need to make sure that they have access to broadband first so that they don't eat up all their cell phone plan data in order to speak with their physicians and their care teams. Second, many telehealth platforms for patient remote monitoring are not language concordant. Language concordant is still seen as a nice to have for a lot of these remote patient monitoring applications and not a must have. Health systems of the future are no longer the future. We have an opportunity to close the equity gap and unless we rapidly scale and invest in digital health for underserved communities and ensure that they're culturally and linguistically appropriate, we risk leaving our communities even further behind. Next slide. And perhaps the most important reflection for us is expressing gratitude and appreciation as the key to resilience. We're in times that call for resilient leadership. And with that, I would like to close these final two slides, thanking my operational partner and friend, Paula Jameson, who teaches me about leadership every day. We also thank our extraordinary leadership team and Ultimate Clinic teams who are our heroes on the front line. Thank you. Ravi, thank you so much for that. Um, I, I, can I quote you? I really enjoyed what you said. Um, the, care, the care has changed, but, but caring has not. Or our responsibility for caring is not. I love that. Care has changed, caring has not. Um, can you mention, you know, moving to telehealth uh, so quickly, I'm sure was really challenging. What, what type of cooperation did, were you getting from uh, the payers? Uh, and did you have to do anything to uh, bring them on board? Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks, Evan. Um, we work with 13 health plans and have a mix of patients in, in lots of different populations. Um, and um, I think as a soft and you alluded to in the beginning, you know, there's just a recognition here um, that this is not business as usual and we have to build to the future we want to stand in. So we are building towards a world where telehealth is the future and not worrying about um, whether or not it will stay. Um, our health plans today, um, CMS has recently said that starting next year, telephonic care will not be reimbursed. So instead of us walking back to face-to-face -face visits, we're moving forward into video visits. And so that's where we're moving our energy today. Um, similarly, payers have been trying to give us um, increased P4P dollars um, as a way to sort of fund other care to take place. Um, so a few of our health plans, our larger health plans here in California today, have doubled the paper performance incentive dollars as a way to give us additional funding streams. By no means are these going to be sufficient, um, but they give us a path to align our financial revenue streams to the supporting infrastructure and technology infrastructure we're trying to build. Great question. Thank you so much, so much Ravi. All right, we're going to keep moving. Uh, I'm proud to introduce uh, Dr. Justin Sanders. Justin is a core faculty at Ariadne. He's with the Serious Illness Care Program, and he's an instructor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and an attending physician in psychosocial oncology and palliative care at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and the Brigham and Women's Hospital. And Justin will be presenting the Serious Illness Care Program's COVID-19 Toolkit. Justin. Thank you, Evan. I'm really grateful to be here to share what I believe demonstrates the very best capabilities of both our team and the lab as a whole. Um, notwithstanding the traumatic events of the past two weeks, this is really an extraordinary time with unprecedented challenges for communities and the clinicians that care for them. These include profound social isolation, collective fear and distress over the risk of COVID-19, and uncertainty regarding its implications, 
and amplification of healthcare disparities for those who are socially and medically vulnerable. Healthcare professionals are living a traumatic event in slow motion with consequences for our own well being that are both certain and unpredictable. And we're facing new complexity around communicating risk and uncertainty in ways that are technologically mediated and never more urgent. So over the last seven years, our program has helped health systems move from reactive approaches to communication to proactive population health interventions. This pandemic presented an opportunity to build on the expertise that we've cultivated and bring it to bear in helping health systems respond to this moment. So I'm gonna share with you the process we undertook and the outcomes of that process. Next slide, please. This is the Ariadne arc of design, test, and spread. In this case, we built a team, proposed a scope of work, clarified design principles and values, and adapted our serious illness conversation guide, a tested clinical tool in widespread use. Evidence of its potential utility in response to COVID-19 came in the form of several adaptations sent to us by partners in the early days of the pandemic. Many of these were several pages long, however, and reflected in their focus on life-sustaining treatments, a fundamental worry about the need to ration intensive care resources. We realized that where we could add clear value was in developing tools that maintain a focus on simplicity, no more than one page, person-centeredness with primary importance of patients' goals and values in determining care plans, usability accompanied by implementation resources, and evidence through rapid testing and iteration. We obtained rapid feedback from key stakeholders, including clinicians who were willing to rapidly use them in practice. We used the feedback to refine these tools prior to dissemination. And finally, we pushed these tools out into the world with a dedicated website, through social media, using webinars with our community of practice and direct communication with innovation partners and health systems in our collaborative. We developed and published scholarly products and media that highlighted these tools. Next slide. This toolkit holds resources for multiple settings. We developed these resources to help patients feel informed, prepared, and cared for, for clinicians to feel prepared and supported to engage clinicians and families in conversations and decision-making, and for health system leaders to disseminate simple, scalable tools and resources that facilitate a proactive communication approach to this pandemic. Our ambulatory care resources include a conversation guide, an implementation guide, video demonstration, um, and other implementation tools. Similarly, our um, Inpatient guide featured a, a new guide, a video, and a, and a guide for crisis standards of care. Resources for long-term care and other nursing facilities include a demonstration video and a guide. And finally, we built on work with the Conversation Project to develop a guide for patients and families to use together to prepare and plan. These resources have been translated into at least six languages, including some of those spoken in some of the world's emerging hotspots. Next slide, please. Together, we hope that these tools help uh, provide a whole system approach to communication in response to COVID-19. It includes care delivery model components, clinician training and support, and communication tools. As with many aspects of COVID-19, um, we are, excuse me, we are looking to apply for funding now to support our uh, evaluation of implementation amount across the Mass General Brigham system. I just wanna finish by saying that high quality communication <clears throat> has never been more urgent. The number of those at risk of dying far exceeds the number of those with serious illness who have been our primary focus in our program. We hope that the tools and strategies that we've developed and disseminated can ease the suffering of this moment for the unprecedented many who face this risk and uncertainty. Thank you. Justin, thank you so much. Uh, it's really been amazing to see the work that the serious illness team has done here, adapting uh, a, the serious illness guide for COVID. Uh, and I know it's been widely used, uh, it's been endorsed by the CDC, uh, and I'm just really proud of the work. You know, when we are designing something new like this or adapting, um, I'm curious how you feel about, like what, what do you attribute the agility and the speed in this situation to be able to move so quickly? Well, I think aside from sort of absorbing the sheer panic of the healthcare system at large, um, I think that, um, you know, we were able to really take a pause, which I think is really important, and reprioritize some of the activities that we had going on. I'd like to emphasize the fact that 
the that in taking this pause in a, in a moment of urgency, we were really uh, intentional about sticking to our values. And I think that allowed us to generate products that were not purely um, responsive to the thing that felt most urgent, which I think at the time of, uh, at the beginning of this pandemic, pandemic was really about concern about resources um, and about whether or not we were gonna have enough resources. And what we really stuck to was the importance of, um, of uh, values and goals driving care um, as long as possible, and really, um, as we've uh, as has been a core value for us from the beginning, and I think um, holding on to that actually gave us energy to um, to really um, work outside of our typical workflows and um, and come together to create something um, really with a lot of breadth, and and that's been very useful for health systems um, across the country and around the world. And just we have another quick question. Um, you know, the I think the serious illness program has always been about how to have conversations about goals and values. And you, you, you mentioned it very quickly, um, but you, we ended up creating also a crisis guide, how to have a conversation in crisis conditions. And I know that was, that was hard to do because the core has always been around communication skills and, and values and goals. Uh, maybe you could just mention uh, how we managed to do that around the crisis resources. Yeah, well, we really wrestled with whether or not we should be participating in the creation of a crisis guide, just to say. And yet what we kept hearing from health systems was the need to, was the need to feel prepared in case that happened and really to do so in a way that um, felt compassionate um, and skillful at the same time. And so um, I think in, it, was, it was a guide with which we wrestled the most, I think, in terms of how to get the language right, consulting with ethicists, consulting with inpatient colleagues, our people who were our colleagues who work in the inpatient setting, um, to really think about how we could sort of um, strike a balance between needing to um, you know, communicate something incredibly difficult, which I think is at the heart of a lot of our commu difficult communication that we help support with the guides, and also, um, you know, not um, um, make that the emphasis of, uh, make, you know, make the restriction of resources the emphasis of the conversation. So it was, that was a real uh, challenge I think we faced in, the, in uh, creating that guide. Justin, thank you so much. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Lauren Kennedy Metz. Lauren is a postdoctoral research fellow affiliated with the Department of Surgery at Harvard Medical School. And she works in the Division of Cardiac Surgery at the VA Boston Healthcare System in West Roxbury. Her presentation is titled, Development of a COVID-19 Cognitive Aid to Support Operating Room Personnel. Lauren? Thank you so much. Um, I'm excited to share this work, which is funded by the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute of the NIH and led by Dr. Marco Zanotti and represents a long-standing collaboration among the following labs. Dr. Zanotti leads the Medical Robotics and Computer Assisted Surgery Lab at Harvard Medical School and the Division of Cardiac Surgery at the VA Boston, and this lab includes myself and Annette Phillips. Dr. Roger Diaz le leads um, the Human Factors and Cognitive Engineering Lab at Stratus Center for Medical Simulation and Brigham and Women's Hospital. Our UMass Amherst collaborators of the Laser Lab include Drs. George Brunin, Lori Clark, Lee Osterweil, and Heather Conboy. And finally, Dr. Julian Goldman leads the MD Plug and Play Lab at Mass General, which also includes Dave Arney. And the work I'm sharing today is the latest project that has been developed through these interdisciplinary teams, which brings together human factors, computer science, and cardiac surgery. And it's built off of substantial prior work by this group. Um, on the next slide, uh, we'll see some of the motivation. The additional protective measures that have been mandated by COVID-19 create a cognitive burden for surgical team members. And furthermore, uh, additional stress on the team is caused by the potentially devastating consequences of missing steps or committing an error. The ultimate impact of committing an error in this case is not only reduce safety to the patient, but also reduce safety of the entire surgical team given the increased likelihood of exposure and infection. In major surgery in particular, and namely in cardiac surgery, this impact is heightened given the reliance on aerosol generating procedures, which further increases the likelihood of viral exposure to the team. So to offset some of this additional cognitive load and stress, we propose a COVID-19 specific cognitive aid, the COVID-19 surgery support system. 
This system is being developed to support operating room personnel in the adoption of new procedures, building upon prior research that has identified excessive cognitive load as a key cause of the commission of errors that reduce patient safety. On the next slide, please. Um, development of this system is currently underway, uh, integrating COVID-19 specific considerations into existing OR process models that are then used to automatically create context-sensitive or smart checklists to provide real-time guidance. On this slide is an example of the required steps for select provider roles when pre preparing the cardiac operating room in the current pandemic climate. This image shows uh, the meat of the checklist. In the expanded form, you can toggle which roles are visible at any given time. And you can see here that each team member has their own set of steps and their own checklist to follow, but they're also often intertwined with checklists of other team members. Our goal for, is for these checklists to be utilized by taking into account the universal precautions with all patients in the current climate. Um, and we are identifying these emergent COVID-19 specific considerations through published guidelines, novel protocols developed by surgical departments, feedback from subject matter experts, and interviews with end users. Next slide, please. We expect to see a change in team members' cognitive load and improved safety primarily for the healthcare providers uh, and secondarily for patients as well. We also expect to see a long lasting impact given that the protective policies imposed by COVID-19 will not go away anytime soon and new staff members will face similar challenges that current staff members are facing today. Furthermore, the methods utilized in our approach are not restricted to COVID-19 or this context, but rather can generalize to create smart dynamic checklists across domains and settings. We envision this being a tool to facilitate adapting to ongoing changes through medical simulation and or mental practice approaches in the short term and real-time guidance in the long term. So thank you so much for your time and I'm happy to take any questions with the time we have left. Lauren, thank you. We, have, we are getting a few questions and I wanna remind everyone attending, please use, continue to use the Q&A function. We're getting some good questions. Um, uh, Lauren, when Ariadne's work around checklists, um, has really shown that the checklists are so much more than a reminder system, but they really help to improve uh, teamwork and situational awareness and culture. Um, how do you think this will be the same here? Yeah, um, thanks for bringing this up. The work that your group has done with checklists is actually such a great example of um, leveraging medical simulation approaches to effectively evaluating checklists while maintaining a balance between experimental control and uh, introducing a realistic setting. And we plan to similarly use medical simulation to evaluate the effects of our checklists on various outcomes. And so in response to your question, the short answer would be yes, that we would expect to similarly see a benefit beyond just checking off the boxes and going through the motions, but on a larger scale, um, an increase in individual and team level situation awareness, as well as teamwork. Um, to improve with the use of our checklist. And this is something that we would be evaluating using um, a number of behavioral taxonomies and um, self-report and observational measures. Thank you so much, Lauren. Thanks. Our last speaker in the first uh, session here is Mary Brindle. Uh, uh, Mary is a pediatric surgeon and a health systems researcher. She's the incoming director of the Safe Surgery, Safe Systems program here at Ariadne Labs, and we're delighted to have Mary join us on July 1st. She's right now the director of the Providence of Alberta's Surgery Strategic Care Network and a professor of surgery at the University of Calgary. Mary's presentation is titled Managing and Navigating Safe Systems Through COVID-19. Mary? Thank you. So during the pandemic, our Safe Surgery and Safe System team has had to pivot to address the challenges COVID poses to our health system. Uh, next slide, please. The graph on the left illustrates the value of flattening the curve to prevent a surge in patients from overwhelming our health system. Uh, this is likely very familiar to everyone who's on the line and keeping the peak number of cases below our system capacity has really been the goal of many public health measures. Yet despite these efforts, the curve in many of our centers has looked a little bit more like the red curve on the right side of the screen, where the peak is higher and broader than we would like. Although public health measures are the cor cornerstone of our response, certainly increasing our system's capacity is also absolutely essential. 
And much of the time when we think about this increased capacity, we think of it in terms of hospital beds and ventilators and concrete, things like that. But this ignores really our most important resource, resource during COVID, the human resource. Next slide, please. Our team, supported by the Argosy Foundation grant, has a three-pronged approach to addressing the human resource demands during COVID. And these include identifying the characteristics of rapid, effective, and safe redeployment for health systems as a first aim. As a second aim, identifying the characteristics of rapid, effective, and safe onboarding for individuals. And as a third aim, creating and testing tools and implementation guidance that can be used to address future human resource needs during COVID and other healthcare crises. Uh, so I'll present the pilot results for our first aim that consist of interviews of health system leaders in which we explore the strategies that have been used for human resource redeployment. Last slide, please. So the following themes arose during seven interviews that were performed across five different sites in four countries. And these, uh, these eight themes are as follows. Number one, that systems are required um, to understand um, where their needs might be and have a response to that so they could proactively anticipate these. Number two, that we must be aware of our sources of human resources so that we can tap them when they're required during a surge. Number three, we must cultivate and activate on the ground leadership. And number four, the communication is going to be a cornerstone of our approach and they're needed to address fears and provide information and be provided frequently and in a timely fashion. Number five, we should uh, support the deployed staff, staff with local training and local mentorship. And number six, despite the urgent need of uh, human resources during health crises such as COVID, we still need to pay attention to credentialing checks and good onboarding. Number seven, although trainees may be redeployed during a crisis like COVID, promotion of these trainees to staff is rarely considered and they're certainly a bit of a vulnerable population in our response and have to be considered that way. And I think number eight, and finally, at the heart of all of this, the focus must remain on patient safety and staff well-being. And I think that was a theme that really came up quite frequently uh, during our interviews. I welcome any questions now. Thank you very much. So, so Mary, this is great. Thank you so much. You know, one of the, the questions as we think about Ariadne and our basic arc. Uh, you're in the. You're very much in the design phase here. Mm -hmm. uh, you're learning from others, and the goal is ultimately to create a, a tool that could then be used. And so I'm curious what you think about what will what will the prototype of that tool look like, and how how could that be then tested? I think it's a really good question, and. Um, I think it's one of the difficulties when you're trying to design a tool in the middle of a health crisis itself um, to recognize that uh, it has to be very adaptable. And I think that's one of the first uh, elements of the tool that we have to uh, recognize that whatever we create at the beginning uh, may not look uh, like the tool that we eventually might be using towards the end of a crisis like COVID. The other thing is that the tool itself is going to need to be usable um, by the health systems approach, but kind of as I illustrated in that uh, the curve and the flattening of the curve, that the intersection between public health and the health systems itself has to be part of it. So I think that what this will need to be is it will need to be a simple tool that is able to pull up available data very quickly in order to anticipate um, need as well as to quickly evaluate available resources and that those can be adapted by centers that are looking to, to develop a quick uh, response. So I'd say that the data is going to be needed, um, but also that flexibility. All right, thank you so much. Um, I don't see any other questions. So we're going to end our first session. That was an incredible first session. Uh, we have four more rapid fire talks coming up, uh, but just to pause for a second, let all that wash over you. Um, you know, we learned a little bit about how federally qualified health centers uh, responded to COVID. Uh, we learned how Ariadne uh, created and adapted their conversation guide for uh, patients who contract COVID. 
uh, how architectural design uh, uh, can be used to improve care, uh, the impact that of nursing care models has on care, uh, how checklists can be used to decrease stress in the time of COVID, and understand early planning of how we move human resources in a time of crisis. So incredible stuff, all happening very, very quickly. I'm gonna uh, hand over the uh, moderate, moderator role to my colleague, uh, Dr. Susan Haas. Uh, Dr. Haas is an obstetrician gynecologist and a core faculty member here at Ariadne. Uh, she's the co-PI for Ariadne Lab's work in understanding system expansion, focusing on reducing the risks uh, to patients when health systems expand or contract. Uh, she's been a great friend and colleague of mine for very many years, and a pleasure to have her uh, moderate the second session. Susan. Thank you, Evan. Leading off our second session is Jun Ho Kim. Jun Ho is a fellow in general medicine and primary care at Ariadne Labs, Harvard Medical School, and the Brigham and Women's Hospital. The title of this presentation is Global Learnings in Adapting Health Systems for Pandemic Response. Jun Ho, take it away. Thank you, Susan, and to the Ariadne community for this opportunity to share about our global learning work, um, of which I'm representing a large team. Uh, next slide, please. So this week in Foreign Affairs, in an article titled Exceptionalism is Killing Americans, Jeremy Conendike wrote that the notion that the United States is unique among nations and that the American way is invariably the best has blinded the country's leaders and many of its citizens to potentially life-saving lessons from other countries. And in the Financial Times this week, we can see that the United States has essentially adopted a strategy that has led us to plateau in the number of daily cases. In many other countries, despite having large outbreaks, many have actually bent the curve. So if we're committed to saving lives, we need to get beyond our complacency and exceptionalism and learn from these other countries and adapt their lessons here. Next slide. So as such, uh, in March, we set out to study both positive and negative outlier countries like South Korea, Japan, and Italy, and distill infection control and prevention principles and strategies that could be compared and adapted in other countries. We reached out into the Boston public health and medical community and partnered with a dozen volunteers across three teams. The teams interviewed over 40 frontline providers and health officials across the three countries and procured various protocols and playbooks at the national and hospital level. We produced two evidence briefs, one on Korea that was released last month on the Ariadne website, and another on Japan that we'll release this week, along with an Italian brief that's in progress. We've also written smaller focused case studies in collaboration with colleagues, such as a case study on the outbreak in Tegu, which was published in New England Journal Catalyst last week. In the Tegu study, we highlight key ways that local health systems can respond to future waves of the pandemic to bend the curve, minimize nosocomial infections, and maintain care for non-COVID-19 patients. Meanwhile, we were fortunate to work with a group of over 130 volunteers from around the world on the COVID Translate project, which used crowdsourcing to translate nearly 20 protocols and guidelines from South Korea into up to six languages. Thanks to our Ariadne network, we've been able to share this with a variety of stakeholders from the Gates Foundation to our local Massachusetts COVID-19 State Command Center to the Italian government. Next slide. So the power of this project has been really in the collaboration and crowdsourcing of perspective, skills, and social networks. We're in a unique time uh, when we can rapidly mobilize people around the world and collaborate across platforms from Zoom to Slack to Google Docs. This effort truly would not have been possible without an incredible team of motivated and highly resourceful individuals. Next slide. So to take this to the next level this summer, our Ariadne primary healthcare team will be facilitating convenings with multiple countries through the Joint Learning Network and the Gates Foundation. This will allow countries to compare and contrast their strategies for COVID uh, response. We also hope to engage in substantive discussions, including policymakers in Japan, to make sure these lessons lead to continuous improvement in preparation for future waves of COVID-19 and future pandemics. We're very big in America on breakthrough innovations, but we at Ariadne emphasize the value of follow-through innovations. 
if we're able to understand the strategies that other governments and public health agencies have put together, the keys to success are all there. We just have to be willing to think globally, even while we act locally. Thank you. Thank you, Jun Ho. Um, I have really a two-part question for you. Um, what's the top lesson from these countries that you would want to see implemented in the United States? And then secondly, what's the biggest barrier in the United States beyond exceptionalism as a way of thinking to get these lessons implemented? Thank you, Susan. Um, I think uh, the first kind of basic but really big picture lesson is that the virus can be contained through public health fundamentals. We don't have to be at this plateau. It's not an invisible enemy. Uh, we can make it visible through better coordination, testing, and tracing. And I think these other countries have shown that we can weaken it through physical distancing, hand hygiene, and masks. Um, I know you said uh, kind of top lesson, but uh, one other lesson for me has been that the departments of public health or command centers really need the authority and protocols to coordinate across hospitals and clinics. Uh, when we first asked South Korean health officials and ID doctors about um, how they protected their healthcare workers, it actually, the first answer wasn't about PPE, which is unquestionably critical. The first response was really, we triage patients by their risk level into designated COVID-19 hospitals and isolation units. And so they were able to keep suspected cases um, separate from non-COVID patients and providers. So we can't continue our strategy um, of triaging patients once they show up in the emergency room. We have to look and coordinate more broadly. Um, and just uh, lastly, in terms of just a barrier, I think other than exceptionalism, I, uh, I do think our fragmented healthcare and payment system are significant barriers of having a coordinated strategy. Uh, when health systems, screening centers, and laboratories are all operating independently and in separate contracts with multiple payers, it's really hard to have a unified response. Great, thanks so much, Jun Ho. Our next presenter is Richard Gittimer. Richard's the director of the Brigham Health Primary Care Center of Excellence. He'll be speaking on primary care, flattening the curve while the system manages the peak. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Susan. Um, I'm gonna share with you how we attempted to meet the acute and chronic care needs of our patients during the COVID pandemic at Brigham Health Primary Care. Um, our operating premise was the primary care's role in the pandemic response uh, was to help flatten the curve. Um, next slide, please. Um, this slide outlines our tactics um, in order to meet our patients' needs, minimize staff exposure, um, and preserve PPE. We consolidated into a few sites, as you see here. We performed in-person visits at the respiratory illness clinic and the non-respiratory clinics. We only provided virtual care at our operational sites, which was most of our sites. These sites managed acute and chronic conditions and provided virtual visits uh, before any in-person visit at a respiratory or non-respiratory site. They also performed all the remaining non-visit activities of a primary care practice. We executed both virtual and in-person outreach strategies for vulnerable populations. Um, we did phone and video outreach um, that was uh, to um, medically and socially uh, at-risk patients. And then we provided temporary in-person sites. Uh, they were erected in neighborhoods that were most impacted by COVID. Uh, and in these sites, we offered COVID testing, social determinant screening, uh, provision of food resources and safety kits. Next slide, please. Um, it's um, too early to determine clinically uh, meaningful outcome measures. Uh, but our hypothesis was that maintaining substantive interactions with our patients was a first step to delivering high quality. So we decided to use encounters as a process measure. In the vertical bar graph, um, we show overall patient touches, and this includes face-to-face, -face, telemedicine, phone and electronic messages, and um, social work encounters. And so you see by the third week, um, 70 to 80% of our total encounters we achieved 70 to 80% of our total encounters uh, compared to baseline. And then by um, early April, our virtual volume had, um, a, had approached 70 to 80% um, of our baseline in-person volume. Um, the outreach initiatives touched about 2,000 people per site. Now, unfortunately, not all of our outcomes were as favorable. And if you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, these graphs represent one proxy for the impact on clinical quality. The sudden deflection downward um, in each of the graphs coincides with when we mobilized for COVID. And some of this was unavoidable, but I think in retrospect, 
um, we might have been more intentional about developing processes to collect key labs and utilizing home monitoring more effectively. Now, the rapid transformation made by our practices employed strategies and interventions that we'd previously been very slow to adopt, but were very interested in, 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 uh, in implementing. So we hope to use our COVID response as an inflection point, furthering our uh, pursuit of, of sort of the ideal primary care. The tactics required to execute our response to COVID resulted in higher levels of team-based care, patient-centered care, um, equity and, volume, and value. Uh, the pandemic has been tragic on many levels. However, the urgency of the need provided the activation energy for us to acquire new skills and adopt key tactics that will help to accelerate our pursuit of ideal primary care. So thanks for your attention and I'm happy to entertain questions with whatever time's left. So we have one question, uh, Richard, and that is about uh, how is this going to impact uh, primary care? Is this an inflection point? for how primary care is gonna function going forward? I mean, I think, it, I mean, it is an interesting opportunity um, in that um, just the, the acute need and the acute crisis um, forced us to do things that we hadn't done before or we hadn't done at any scale before. Um, and, and that includes team-based care where we created these respiratory clinics and non-respiratory clinics and we had to share the care of a patient where we um, uh, adopted virtual care, um, we did uh, more telephonic care than we had done previously, um, that we did proactive outreach to vulnerable patients, whether they be socially vulnerable or medically vulnerable. Um, and then uh, and the in-neighborhood outreach, you know, we'd struggled with some of our quality measures for the final 10 to 15%. Um, and I think a lot of that's an equity issue. And so doing this type of outreach and showing us that we can do these things um, and that it isn't so disruptive, um, I think will, uh, will be very powerful as you try to move forward. And we're putting a lot of effort in trying not to lose that momentum. Great, and then uh, the 20 seconds that remain, um, could you speak to telehealth at all and what you learned and what, how that might change? I mean, I think that uh, as, a as a primary care doc, um, there's a lot that telehealth can offer. And I think that a substantive portion of our visits going forward can definitely be telehealth. And I'll be honest, before this pandemic, I believe that telehealth didn't offer anything more than, um, than a telephone call. And, and I was wrong. Um, it's much richer, the patients uh, appreciate it. There are things you can do without requiring the patient to come in, it's more time efficient. Um, there's obviously some support strategies that we have to develop. Uh, but um, I, I think um, it's demonstrated us its power. Great. Thanks so much, Richard. Uh, next up is Shahed Alam. Shahed is the co-founder and president of Nura Health. His presentation is titled Supporting Health at Home, Implementing a Rapid Learning Driven COVID-19 Health Facility and Community Training Program. Shahed. Thanks so much and uh, good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> So since, the, since March 25th, um, and after the Prime Minister of India initiated a countrywide lockdown of 1.3 billion people, um, hundreds of millions of people became aware of COVID-19 and began to feel its impact, especially those in lower resourced communities. Now, imagine you're a person in, in this community. One day, someone in your household has flu-like symptoms. You're not sure if it's signs of COVID, so you look to the local clinic for support. It's closed, transportation's limited, and your neighbor said that the hospital is actually a dangerous place to go right now. How do you know what to do for your loved one? How do you know where to go and how do you know how to keep yourself safe? From the beginning of the pandemic, we were committed to be there for these communities, patients and caregivers, so that they have the confidence that they need to support the ones that they love. At Nora Health, our COVID-19 response really stems from our learnings of scaling a family caregiver training program across more than 150 hospitals in India and Bangladesh. And central to our response is a rapid research and a needs finding assessment today. Next slide, please. This research was conducted across four states in India beginning in mid-March, and we interviewed more than 5,000 individuals and conducted more than 100 qualitative interviews. Um, and this was to understand the knowledge, risk perceptions, and practice of preventive behaviors. And uh, what we initially found was that basically all of our respondents from the very beginning understood what COVID-19 was, and they understood it was important, at least. 
However, given this, what we found about risk perceptions was very surprising. And over the past two months, the vast majority of people do not feel that they themselves or their communities are at risk of getting COVID-19. Um, but even early on, what we found was that people actually felt that they had received enough information about, uh, about COVID-19. Next slide, please. And what else we found was that what remained steady over the last two months was a low performance of the most critical preventive behaviors that people needed to be practicing at home. And when we really dug deeper about why, most uh, were just not simply able to recall the specific steps that they were supposed to do uh, to prevent the infection at home. And so with all of this data in mind, uh, we launched our COVID response. Next slide, please. The, the primary objective of our, of our response is to um, drive positive behavior change and adoption and retention in as many at-risk communities as quickly as possible. And our model of behavior change really rests on three key components. The first element is, is really about designing well-designed content that is comprehensive. We found from our research that people felt that they were getting enough information but they weren't getting the right information, they weren't getting comprehensive information or contextualized information. So we worked hard to do that as quickly as possible. Next, we partnered with the government and more than 35 organizations to train and upskill their frontline staff. And these care workers to frontline workers uh, to, um, in, in grassroots nonprofits. And we really chose these organizations because they're the, they're the people that communities turn to for support during this crisis. And finally, we leverage the same digital tools like WhatsApp that was actually the source of a lot of misinformation, and we turned it into a tool for empowerment and support. So over the last month, two months, um, our strategy has evolved a lot as well. We began with focusing on equipping uh, people with skills for prevention, but now our focus is actually a lot on empowering family caregivers of COVID-19 suspected or positive cases to heal better at home. And we are launching this service, which is a phone-based training initiative uh, in partnership with the government. And we really believe that this is an incredibly important step in the right direction to allow people to heal safely at home and also to protect healthcare workers and resources in the region. Um, finally, with India passing Italy last week in the number of cases and uh, cases rapidly, rapidly rising in Bangladesh as well, we really have only started our work, um, but we do really believe in the power of family to heal. Thank you so much. Thank you, um, Shahed. Questions are pouring in, so I'm just going to have to triage and some of these will come to you later. Um, the first one is, um, how are you adapting the inter interventions that you have created as you learn from your research? Sure. Um, it's, it's, it's also a bit about, you know, the questions we're asking <clears throat> in the research itself. We are um, adapting our, our tools uh, pretty consistently based off of, you know, generally the, the trends um, that, that are happening around us. Initially, we really uh, looked at the basic preventive behaviors, what was going on in terms of hand washing, physical distancing, masks, um, but then began to, to be more nuanced in terms of trying to understand um, what was happening with high-risk groups, what was happening in terms of access to care, um, and, and the evolution of our, our tool and, and the type of data we're collecting is able to basically give, give that targeted information. Um, what we're doing now is actually being very targeted with our, with our actual population that we're targeting and um, we're partnering with specific departments in the government to get access to uh, those vulnerable populations and so um, we're adapting our tools to collect data in, in that way. Okay, I'm going to have to triage and I get to pick the question here. Um, <laughs> were you able to see how COVID changed people's perceptions about the health system? And are those perceptions going to stick or degrade? Right. Um, that's a really great question. I think <clears throat> what, what we did find is that because the government had a, had a very swift response um, from the beginning with, with the nationwide lockdown, um, and really all of COVID care being managed within the public health system, um, it did, uh, you know, push a lot of, you know, kind of uh, people to, to engage uh, for the first time with the public health system, which they may not have otherwise. 
And you know, for, for the most part, um, especially at in many of the municipal levels, you know, that that care has been provided uh, well, and that experience, um, for the most part, you know, can be described as well. And so, um, I think it, it has given a, a boost to the public health system in that way, and 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 the perception there. Um, but but I think you know, as again, the challenge really right now is as cases are growing. Um, you know, the, the, the system is just becoming way more constrained and uh, in places like Mumbai, which are really hotbeds of, of this, um, it's really difficult to, to find and coordinate a bed. Um, and uh, what we see is, you know, call centers are, are not uh, being able to handle the volume of calls that are coming in. Um, and just some of the basic systems that we're working earlier on are, are breaking down. So um, I think, you know, how we, how we mitigate these, uh, these things are, are, are really going to determine the future of this disease. Yep. Multiple intersecting threads. Thank you, Shayad. Thank you so and much. And last but not least, our final presenter is Jay Want. Jay is executive director of the Peterson Center on Healthcare. He'll be presenting What I Did on My Spring Break, Building a Way for Colorado to Reopen in 35 Days. Jay? Thanks so much, Susan, and it's a pleasure to be here at RAIBE. Um, as, uh, as Susan mentioned, I'm the executive director of the Peterson Center on Healthcare, which is based in New York City, but I spent most of my adult life in uh, Colorado, and that's where I chose to sequester when the cases were rising in New York. So when I got here, I contacted a friend of mine who was the senior health policy advisor for Governor Jared Polis and said, I'm here, I'm here for the duration, uh, put me to work, and in fact, they did. Next slide, please. Uh, so I became part of something called the Innovation Response Team. The Innovation Response Team was a team of 40 to 50 state employees that were handpicked for the task, along with a private sector component, uh, largely from our tech corridor in, Bo in Boulder, uh, to develop software that was necessary. Five out of six teams were actually tasked to the uh, normal things that uh, everybody needed in order to be able to answer the pandemic. Uh, PPE, uh, ventilators, uh, contact tracing, uh, reagent for, uh, for doing the testing. My team was called the New Normal Team and its mission is at the top. It was the one team that was actually focused on trying to uh, anticipate what was going to happen in the next phase uh, when we were able to reopen the state. Fortunate basically to assemble this team in uh, about a week and a half um, and for them to bring each individual kind of competencies and expertise that were vital to the task. Russ McKelvey is a lieutenant uh, colonel in the Army National Guard here and is a military planner by, uh, by trade. David Pedrino is a former uh, chief of staff for the lieutenant governor here at New uh, State Government Inside and Out. Jane Brock brought epidemiologic and optometric expertise and Adam Siegel kept us all together by doing knowledge management. Uh, he's an algebra teacher in Oakland, California um, uh, in his day job. Finally, Rob Hearn and the learning and analytics team were basically a full team from an international consultancy that was on loan to the state um, in order to be able to do some of the deep dive research that was necessary. Next slide. And this basically is the sequence uh, from week one to week seven. Uh, I, I now, watching these presentations, wish we'd had June Ho's uh, guides uh, at the time, but uh, this is the last week in March, and so none of that was available. Our team actually did a lit review, uh, coming up with 13 kind of uh, countries and two states that were ahead of us at the time. From there, in weeks two through four, we actually abstracted industry by industry, the best guidance we could find, and constructed plays that looked like the slide on the, on the right. Uh, this one's for manufacturing with high, medium, and low levels of viral suppression according to what the circumstances were on the ground at that point. Week five actually turned out to be one of the more challenging weeks in that uh, the getting out of technical knowledge in itself is challenging enough. But this week was really dedicated to, through the, uh, the policy team at the governor's office, bouncing up what we thought was, should happen with people who actually were going to have to implement that. So there was a rapid cycle adaptation with real feedback from the field on what was going to work and what would not. Last two weeks were really clean up. Uh, the, the governor was able to announce a reopening of the state on April 27th, and we handed off basically in those last two weeks to the state agencies who would have to administer the guidance with each of the relevant industries. Next slide. So these were really the kind of quick takeaways from that. 
First of all, this, uh, this was really not possible without all the competencies that the, each member of the team actually brought to this, but they produced an amazing amount of progress in a short period of time, about 108 pages of guidance and 50 uh, pages of checklists for, uh, for industries for 5.8 million people in 35 days. Uh, as you might imagine, this required rapid cycle processing, about uh, two meetings a day as a whole group, and then smaller ones with each individual component. And then finally, the most surprising thing for me was that the, the technical part was not the most difficult part. It was actually the give and take that you had to uh, engage in for, with people who were actually having to administer each of the sets of guidance that we produced. For anybody interested, you can follow the URL at the bottom of the slide, but uh, I want to thank you for your attention and be happy to take any questions at this point. Um, thanks, Dad. So I'll ask you, now that we have all these states reopening and um, the data coming in about what happens, uh, as these states reopen, what's the one lesson that you would like to share with them? I think it's the, the latter. The, um, even within Colorado, there's a wide variety of different settings. There are some places having big outbreaks and other places that didn't have any outbreaks at all. And so basically that give and take between the people who are actually administering um, and the people on the ground and rad rapid adaptation uh, is really, I think, key to uh, maintaining public acceptance and, and buy-in uh, for this. In many ways, this really does mirror the, the RA on the ARC um, in that, you know, the first phase of designing is actually pulling down the literature, but testing and spreading, actually, we didn't have the luxury of separating those two phases. So this is the documents that we produce, I think, continue to be kind of a living document with each uh, bit of information and, and uh, data that we're able to subsequently gather. Great. Thank you, Jay. So we have Thank heard you. the value of learning from outside the United States, the power of teams, the power of teams, um, uh, how things are going to change and data to drive behavior. So with that, I'm going to thank Jay again and turn back to Evan for concluding remarks. Great. Uh, there was, Susan, there was one, one question which came in that I think would be a, a good one before I conclude address to uh, Rick uh, Gittimer, um, I, where there was a concern about what's the, the aftermath of the pandemic? What's it going to mean in terms of financing for primary care, uh, particularly about pediatrics, but also general internal medicine as we go forward. I mean, I think that's, I mean, that's to be seen. I mean, I think obviously a lot of practice, particularly independent practices have been, you know, devastated by, um, you know, by the pandemic. Um, and so I, there's a, there are a lot of efforts to try to, um, to create some support um, for those practices so we don't lose those practices. Um, I, I do think that, um, it, it may for it may have forced more consolidation for those practices. They have the opportunity to join, to join a larger system, um, for better or for worse. And I'm not sure it's better or worse, to be honest with you. Um, and um, what I am hoping is that um, some of the financing for these sort of alternative visits, uh, virtual visits and the like, uh, telephone visits. Um, and recognizing that you can't, that, that paying less for a telephone visit is actually an equity problem and that people um, who have data challenges, uh, you know, and, you know, as you heard earlier today, um, it's a big deal. Um, and so anyway, they, they need to think, rethink about how primary care is financed uh, or, or how the payments are financed. Um, and then lastly, you know, you know, does this start to um, accelerate the discussion around a more global payment for primary care? Uh, which seems more reasonable than um, the sort of per widget uh, way that we're paid right now. So I mean, those are my takes. Um, I, I am worried about the smaller practices that are independent. Though. Well, thank you so much. I really just am so pleased. I, I want to thank our Ariadne staff, uh, uh, all of our staff, particularly those who've been helping this particular program. I want to thank our core faculty and our associate faculty and the panelists who contributed to this. Uh, this has really been an incredible event. Uh, and I think in this time of crisis, you know, we have really seen rapid innovation uh, and am so proud of the way our community is reacting to really pivot to help us treat, uh, prevent, and mitigate uh, the risk of COVID. 
Uh, I want to just say thank you all who attended today. Please be well. Uh, stay in touch with us. Uh, look for future Ariadne Labs uh, meetings. Uh, be well and have a good evening.